Genesis 4. Um, uh, for those of you who are wondering, I um, have the video from uh, my sermon yesterday at Pea Ridge, Arkansas. And it's in the editor right now. And I should have it done as far as editing is concerned. Um, when I get done here, I'll go back to editing it. Should have, have the editing done in another hour after the service. But then it has to render, have to put all the pieces of everything. Um, I did two camera angles. Uh, one was a close-up on me and one was a sort of a broad angle on the congregation in case I moved away from the pulpit, which I did a couple times. Um, so I'm blending those two together plus all the information that's up on the screen. And that'll take some render time, but maybe by this evening um, I'll have it posted on YouTube and then Sermon Audio. Uh, if not... Late this evening, by tomorrow morning, it'll be there. So, we had a, again, we had a good meeting there, and it was good to see our old friends. And, you know, we just don't have that many people um, that we fellowship with because of what we believe and how we believe, and, and uh, not too many people want to believe that way anymore, and that's sad, but that's how it happens. And so um, it's good and refreshing to get back with them. And uh, like I said, uh, Brother Jamie and uh, his dad, Brother Ellis Doyle, they kind of work together pastoring that church. And um, their church is kind of like ours. There's a lot of our family in our church, and there's a lot of the Doyle family in that church. And, but uh, they've been good friends of ours for years. They've been very good to us. And uh, so we like to be a blessing to them. So they've invited us down sometime this spring. It'll probably be, oh, I'm guessing late May, May or late April, maybe in May, that they have us. So we're looking, we're looking forward to it. Uh, by then, I'll be able to um, dewinterize my camper. And uh, that way we can take our bed with us. Because them... Hotel beds sometimes are hard. Lisa's going, my hips hurt. Oh, and I, yeah, I know what you mean. Genesis 4, chapter, uh, verse 10. The story of Cain and Abel. So in Sunday school, I'm teaching typology. Okay? In Sunday school, I'm teaching about typology. I'm sort of laying the, back, the, the, the basement, the framework... What the Bible says about typology. You, you have examples, in samples, allegories, uh, figures, shadows, is all, and similitudes. God uses the word similitude. He said, I use similitudes by the prophets. Similitude has the word similar in it. This is similar to that. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. So... Um, but that doesn't mean that you're going to see a 300 cubit long arc. Okay? In the, when Jesus comes back. Jesus is the ark. Amen? So we are in Jesus, therefore we'll, there is no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. So that's kind of how you understand it. So this morning I said, uh, in, when you're looking at stories in the Bible... When you see women, what do women symbolize in the Bible? Church. A good church or a bad church? A church that worships the true God or a church that worships a stone or a stock, piece of wood? Um, men in the Bible would represent either... Christ or Antichrist, okay, God or Satan. So in Genesis 4, we have two men, Abel and Cain. Who is Abel? He's a picture of Christ. 
because he was the one slain. He didn't do anything wrong. And remember what the Bible said about Abel and his sacrifices. All of his works were righteous. That means Abel is a picture of Christ who was slain. And his sacrifice was accepted. That's Christ. Christ's sacrifice being accepted. So then we have Cain, who the Bible says was of that wicked one. All right? Cain was the murderer. Jesus said about Satan, he was a murderer from the beginning. Meaning that it was Satan that put the idea to kill Abel into Cain's mind. Now, there's a difference between possession and oppression by a devil. I don't believe Cain was possessed. I don't think the devil entered into him, took over his body, and he's just this zombie doing whatever the devil tells him to do. But I think Cain's heart was not right with God. Therefore, you just lean toward listening to the devil more. And the devil gives you suggestions and you go, yeah, that's a good idea. So he killed his brother. Spilled his blood. We're not told exactly how he killed his brother. He just slew his brother. And we know that his blood was spilled because the earth opened her mouth to drink that blood. And remember what I showed you last time that uh, Mystery Babylon has the cup in her hand full of the blood of the martyrs of Jesus Christ. And Abel was one of those martyrs killed for being on God's side. Um, I read last week for Pastor Mike Online on Tuesday, I read Mark 13, Luke 21, and Matthew 24. Those three chapters go together. They are what is called the Olivet Discourse. He, Jesus was on the Mount of Olives, and he was teaching because they asked him a question about the temple. Jesus said, not one stone of this temple will be left on another. So his disciples asked him, when shall these things be? And what will be the sign of thy coming? So Jesus sat down and he gave them a list of things that would happen. Nation shall be against nation. There'll be earthquakes in diverse places. They shall take you up before synagogues and before rulers. Think not what you're going to say. They will kill some of you. That's the story of Cain and Abel. Cain's side always likes to kill Abel's side. Just kill him. For no other reason than serving Jesus Christ. And you would think in a world right now full of illumined minds... They want to think of themselves as having risen above the barbaric traditions of old. Why, we don't literally put gladiators in the ring with real lions and the lions kill the gladiators in front of everyone. We don't do that. So we're supposed to be more illumined or illuminated than they were thousands of years ago. So you would think, well, just because someone wants to believe in a God and a Jesus Christ, well, that doesn't mean that we have to kill them. You would think that's how people would think in the 21st century. Civilized, right? No. What would you say? Not so. I thought you said, I thought you said something about Trump. Because I had Nancy Pelosi in my mind. I had this Jezebel woman. And I could see her drinking the cup of the blood of martyrs of Jesus Christ. She hates. She hates people. She hates them because of what they think. Absolutely she hates them because of what they think. Not because of how they look or where they live or how much money they make. She hates people based upon what they think. Okay. So that's Cain and that's Abel. Now, in verse 10, God said, and he said, what hast thou done? 
Now, God already knows, but again, God, just like God with Adam and Eve, he is causing them to give an account. You stand and tell us what you did. What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. So I know you killed him. So tell me now what you did. So verse 11, God says, Now art thou cursed from the earth. So is Cain in heaven? No, he's cursed. He's cursed. Abel is. And we know Abel is because of the, what we call the faith hall of fame, Hebrews 11. By faith, Abel offered up a, a better sacrifice than that of Cain. Okay? But Cain is cursed. So now art thou cursed from the earth which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. So when thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. A fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be in the earth. And I, I sort of take that in a literal way, I've taken the two ideas together. He tills the ground, but nothing comes up. So he plows and sows. There's nothing there, so he has to move on. Why should he stay there? That ground is wasted. So he has to move on to a different place. Look for food from other sources in order to live. We would assume then that Cain is going to live a pretty long life like Adam lived, 930 years. And Seth, his younger brother, uh, lived 912 years. That's the next chapter. So we would assume then that Cain lives an equally long life, but he's a fugitive. He's a vagabond. He is on the run constantly and running away from people. Now, a little side issue. If you're Adam and Eve and you're living up to 900 years old, how many children can you produce in 900 years? A lot of children. And then, and it says... And Adam had sons and daughters. We don't know how many. So their children have lots of children in 900 years. So the third generation also having lots of children over the period of 900. Because everybody in Genesis 5 lives to be, except for Enoch, he lives to be, they live to be over 900 years old. Every one of them. So they have an extension of life. And I would say this, an extension of a youthful body. They're not growing old quickly like we're growing old. In other words, they don't reach 100 and they can barely move and they stay that way for the next 800 years. I don't believe that. I think they had an extension of a youthful, strong body. So during that time, there is a lot of birthing taking place. And so it won't take long. For there to be quite a few people. Now look at something. Uh, well, look in verse 17 of Genesis 4. Cain knew his wife and she conceived and bare Enoch and he built it a city. Well, if you only have one child, why would you, why would you build a whole city? So you, there probably has to be quite a few other children that were birthed from Cain and his wife. Where did Cain get his wife? Had to be one of his sisters. Had to be. Yeah, I know. Don't look at me. Um, but the genetics, see, we have laws against it now, and they're reasonable because the genetics are, they clutter. And we know from different scenarios. In fact, I'll tell you this. In the Muslim world, they're pretty much killing themselves because most Muslims, faithful Muslims, their desire is to be like um, Muhammad, the prophet, who married inside of his own family. And a lot of Muslim men are incestuous. They marry inside their own family. And they're producing some pretty bad blood. Okay, 
This, we know this was done in the Appalachians years ago, maybe still continuing now in small pockets, and it produces some pretty bad birth defects, okay? But the assumption is that the genetics were pure because Adam and Eve being the first people, then, I mean, think of all the 7 billion people that are on this planet. They all came from Adam. Well, that's quite a range of differentiation in the genes. So it could be very well possible that Adam and Eve conceived a daughter that was black-skinned. I mean, all the way. It could be conceived that they birthed a son who was Samoan in appearance or something like that. So all of the genetics were there and you're talking about the beginning of these bloodlines and these bloodlines are pure so when Cain takes one of his sisters to be wife it's very very possible that her genetics could be so far removed away from his because there's so much there that it's not an issue if they populate and bring in children all right so uh, verse 13 God said, or Cain said unto the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. God could have said, too bad. You're the one that's committed the sin. But he said, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, thou hast driven me out, of this, out this day from the face of the earth, and from thy face shall I be hid, and I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth. And it shall come to pass that everyone that findeth me shall slay me. And the Lord said unto him, Therefore, whosoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. Now, the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should kill him. We're going to talk about that for a few minutes, all right? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we ask your blessings, uh, Lord, on this teaching. Pray, God, that you would open our minds and our hearts to your word. Father, that you would sanctify us, use us for your kingdom and your glory. And Father, we pray, Lord, for those that are sick, those that are hurting. And um, Lord, there's some people that they're just having a tough time right now. And I pray, God, that you would help them and bless them. You know who they are. You know why things are the way they are. And we pray tonight, Heavenly Father, that you would uplift them. We do this, Father, because the next time it may be us who are having the hard time. Maybe us who are having a bad day. And we would want them praying for us and encouraging us and helping us. So, Father, we pray that you'd bless them tonight. We thank you, Lord, for all the good things you've done with us and through us. We ask you to continue those good things, but only for your name's sake, the sake of your kingdom. Father, just illuminate our minds tonight and teach us some great and mighty things. If, Father, we are the generation of people who may very well see these things written in the Bible come to pass, then sharpen our wits and illuminate our minds tonight with your word, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen. So the Lord set a mark upon Cain. Uh, now, we don't know, the Bible doesn't say if God put the mark on Cain's forehead, on his right hand, one side of his body or what the bible doesn't say we're not told so god's saying to us that's not important but notice that here out of the two characters abel and cain the murderer is marked he's put he's something that god did to him was clearly visible and it set cain visibly apart from everybody else there now is it possible that Cain in his offspring passed whatever that mark was down if that mark was actually put into his genetics? It's possible. Again, we're not told. 
But clearly, Cain is, everybody that spots him knows that's Cain. How do you know? See that mark? God put that on him because he killed his brother Abel. And so everybody then knows the story. And they know then because one of the reasons why God put this mark on Cain was so that nobody kill him. The story, you know, you've got maybe a few hundred or maybe a couple thousand people. As the time goes on, people are telling the story. See there, that guy over there? That's Cain. He killed his brother. Well, we should slay him. Uh-uh, he's got to see that mark on him. God put that on him. We were told this by Adam. God put that mark on him because if you kill him, God will get you back sevenfold. Old. Huh? Don't know. Bible doesn't tell us. I, to my knowledge, Bible doesn't tell us. Okay? Does that answer your question? The answer is, who? Okay? However, let's, let's study something. So hold your place there in, in Genesis 4. Go to Revelation 13. Because what comes obviously to mind is, is this related to the mark, what we call the mark of the beast? I have to think that it is. I have to think that it is because of who Cain represents. So in Revelation 13, let's study this for a few minutes. We know in verse 13, we have beasts rising up out of the sea, seven heads, ten horns. One of those heads has a, a wound on it, which caused the death of the beast. One of his heads was, as it were, wounded unto death, and the deadly wound was then healed. So he died, but has been brought back to life. Um, then we have, in verse 11, another beast coming up out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb. And he spake as a dragon. He exercises all the power of the first beast before him and calls of the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. So think of, think of, and think of this beast as being the opposite of Christ, this false prophet being the opposite of, let's say, John the Baptist. To prepare, he goes to prepare the way. The false prophet then is in charge of convincing everybody in the world that this beast is to be worshipped by all mankind. He is, the, he is the false prophet. All the other false prophets that you see both in the Bible and on Trinity Broadcasting Network and YouTube, they are all a picture of the power and the strength of this false prophet. I mean, think of the number of people that Joel Osteen has convinced that he's right in what he says. The power of that smile, the power of the, the way the TV broadcast makes it look all polished and perfect. The fact that people literally buy seats to be able to sit in that building. Okay? That's, nobody's paying money to come in here. No, John, I meant that in a bad way. It's like, how come we're not getting anything other? No, nobody's doing that here. The power that Joel Osteen has over literally millions of people convinces me that it's easy being a false prophet. Because you get a lot of people and you can get a lot of money out of it. So the false prophet has that power with his words, with however he does things. And um, verse 13, he also has the ability to perform great wonders. He doeth great wonders. So he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth inside of men. The false prophet achieved what the prophets of Baal could not. Remember, they tried to get fire to come down from heaven on their altar. It didn't, it wouldn't work. This false prophet succeeds where they failed. This is power. In verse 14, with these signs, he deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword didn't live. Now, I'll ask maybe each one of you here. When God dealt with you, spoke to you about your Bible, did you need a sign or a wonder to go along with it? Or did you just believe it? That's what, I, that's what happened with me. I just believed it. I didn't have 
fire falling down from the sky. I didn't have dead people coming back from the dead. I didn't have uh, uh, angel feathers falling down inside my office. I had none of that. I just, I knew God spoke that to me. I knew it and I believed it. But there are a significant number of people who say, I'll only believe it if you show me a trick. Remember the Jews did that with Jesus. Perform us, do us a miracle. Come on. Do, show us a sign or a wonder. And Jesus upbraided them for that. A wicked and adulterous generation always seeketh after a sign. And that's this generation right here. So, verse 15. He had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak, which has never happened before. And I talked about this here a few weeks ago. Think about what's happening here. This statue of the beast has been animated by the false prophet. Meaning, so I got my alien here. Okay, still have my alien here. Now this thing's made out of, I guess that's rubber. Or silicone or something like that. Silly putty, maybe. This thing doesn't have DNA, doesn't have a brain, doesn't have a nervous system, doesn't have anything like that. It's dead. But what if it started talking? Jack, I would run. You burn it. I'm loud. I'm out of here. Okay? If this thing started talking, something that I had put life into that lifeless object, now, in, X, in Ezekiel 1, the wheels that Ezekiel saw that was beside the four living creatures, that wheel was animated by the spirit of the living creatures. The Bible says the spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. So the spirit of the angels caused those wheels to move on their own. Now, understanding that, I don't. I just believe it. So the false prophet has so much power. He causes this statue to not just move its mouth, but to actually speak and think. Speak with intention. Speak with freedom of will. You can make, you know, the, when you talk to your phone and your phone answers you back, that's all pre-programmed. It's artificial intelligence, but the statements that your phone makes to you are pre-programmed by a programmer. We're talking something way beyond that. This image has a desire and a will, which is unheard of. It would be like if you got in your car... And your car said, I ain't moving nowhere to you. And you started it up and it said, I'm telling you, I'm not going anywhere. Shut me off and get out. Okay? And it has a will of its own and you'd be freaking out. But that's what this image is going to do. It's going to be able to speak. So, now this image, now this image causes... Everybody who will not worship that image should be killed. So that image now is alive enough to have a will of its own to say, if nobody worships, whoever, if, if this guy here doesn't start worshiping me, I want him dead. And that's different from even Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar made an image where everybody fell to it, but they did so because Nebuchadnezzar told them to. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were thrown in the fiery furnace, not because the image wanted it, but because Nebuchadnezzar wanted it. But this case, the image itself wants people killed. Never happened before, ever. So then, verse 16, he causeth. He, who? Uh, is it the false prophet or the image of the beast? Don't know. But he causeth all, both small and great rich and poor, free and bond, notice they're opposites, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. 
So hold that place there and go to Deuteronomy 6. So I have a little theory about that. Those two places are the two places that God told the Israelites they are to bind the word of God to themselves. Deuteronomy 6, verse 6. These words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. Thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house and when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down and when thou risest up. And notice verse 8. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand and they shall be as frontless between thine eyes. The two places that God told the Israelites to bind his word and to this day Jews wear, you'll see these Jewish men wearing what they call a phylactery. And it's a box that has this scripture in it, the, what they call the Shemitah. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. So they have that in a box, and it literally is bound to their forehead. It's as a front lip between their eyes. Same thing, I think, on their hands. But it's kind of a, like an occult version of it. I, I forgot what, how it was they put that on there, but it was, it was weird. It was wacky enough. So I have to do some study on that. But these are the two places. Now, it just seems like to me that this mark and the location of the mark, either in, in the right hand or in the forehead, somehow, some way is a replacement for God's word bound to your hand or as frontless between thine eyes. Does that make sense to everybody? It's, it's a replace, since they've rejected God's word. And, I mean, I'm looking at Sandy right now. Sandy's got her Bible in her hand. Right? And when you're reading it, it says frontlets in your eyes. Okay? So, there, to me, it just, and maybe it's just a wild guess. But there's something about the location of the mark and its replacement of God's word in a person's life. It's like, it's, it's, to me, it's as if God says they're rejecting the Bible. Fine, but there's something that's going to go in its place. I'm going to mark them like I did Cain. And did Cain ever recover from that mark? He bore that till the day he died. But he was marked. By God himself. Um, turn to Ezekiel 8. Ezekiel 8. And then, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to do that. Ezekiel 8, God takes Ezekiel through the temple and he shows him all of the iniquities that go on inside the house of God. I mean, they have, um, there's an, in verse 3, there's an image of jealousy toward the north that provoketh the jealousy. In verse 5, there's an image of jealousy, an altar to the image of jealousy in the entry. And if you look in verse 8, he dug, had to dig a hole in the wall. He's getting inside the temple itself, and he digs this hole in the wall. He looks in there. He went in and saw every form, verse 10, every form of creeping things and abominable beasts and all idols of the house of Israel portrayed on the wall roundabout. They'd taken God's house. They'd taken God's house. And decorated all the walls with all of their gods. All of their images. All of their detestable abominations. I mean, it's the, the way it reads, it, it, it could very well be that they had dirty pictures portrayed upon the walls. I, I won't talk about that, but that, it, that's kind of what I get out of that. These people were wicked. And then you had the women um, in verse, uh, were they weeping for Tamaz? What verse is that? 14? Yeah. 
Behold, there sat women weeping for Tamas. Tamas was the dying God, they call him. He dies and he's awaiting resurrection. He's constantly dying. And um, so verse 18, Therefore I will also deal in fury. Mine eyes shall not spare, neither will I have pity. And though they cry in mine ears with a loud voice, yet will I not hear them. Now look at chapter 9. This is where it gets interesting. He cried also in mine ears with a loud voice, saying, Cause them that have charge of the city to draw near unto me, every man with his destroying weapon in his hand. Behold, six men. What's the number of the beast? Six hundred, three score, and six. There's a reason why God chose six men here. Six men came from the way of the higher gate, which lieth toward the north. And every man a slaughter weapon in his hand. And one man among them was clothed with linen, with a writer's ink horn by his side, which means he had a horn filled with ink and a pen. And, the, and they went in and stood beside the brazen altar. In verse 3, And the glory of the God of Israel was gone up from the cherub, whereupon he was to the threshold of the house, and he called to the man clothed with linen, which had the writer's ink horn by his side. And the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city and through the midst of Jerusalem and set a mark upon the foreheads now, of not the wicked men, but the men that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. So this man is supposed to go and he's, as he sees people praying, as he sees them praying and crying to God because of the abominations that Ezekiel just saw in the house of God, this man is to go and put a mark on their forehead. Not told what it was, just anything you put on there is going to be noticed. So the reason why it's not told to us what it was, it's not important. And I, I had people try to share things with me over the years about this. And they said, you know, it was this or it was that. And, you know, the Jewish tradition did this. And, but the Bible doesn't say that. If the Bible doesn't say it, it's not important. You're looking at the wrong thing. So anyway, in verse 5, he said to the others, he said in mine hearing, go, at, go ye after him through the city and smite and let not your eyes spare, neither have ye pity. Slay utterly old and young, both maids and little children and women, but come not near any man upon whom is the mark and begin at my sanctuary. Then they begin, because judgment begins at the house of God. Amen? So they began at the ancient men which were before the house. So... In this case, God himself was sealing his saints. He was sealing them. And that seal protected them. So the men went out, and it's easy to spot. You look at a man, if he's got a mark on his forehead, he's spared. If you look at a man and he doesn't, they killed him on the spot. Right where they stood, they killed him. And there must have been a great slaughter of people at this time. Because I would imagine that there was more people that were not marked than there was that was marked. Amen? Now, take this then and go to Revelation 7. Because I think Ezekiel 9 then foreshadows the seal of God in their foreheads. Revelation chapter 7. And after these things, verse 1, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, hurt not the earth, neither the sea. Now, we're getting a picture now of what we, we're getting the fulfillment of the picture we just saw in Ezekiel. In Ezekiel, God's going to kill a bunch of people. But before he does, before he sends the guys out killing them, he says, we're going to put a seal on my people. So hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. 
And then he says, I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed 144,000. So this is where you get the 144,000. So these were all Jewish tribes, and so every one of these men, from 12,000 from each tribe, received a mark, a seal of God, in their foreheads. So then God says, now that they're sealed, now I can tell you angels, let the winds blow. And let them, let them destroy what I'm about to destroy. But know this, those who have the seal of God will not be destroyed. Amen? Now, uh, turn to Ephesians chapter 1. This very quickly, just taking you through and getting you know, understanding what this mark is. So, so far, the mark that God gives, the mark that God gave in Ezekiel, the mark that God gave in Revelation 7, that mark protected his people. But it also sealed them because that mark was, I think, intended to be permanent. You carried it for life. You carried it forever. So, in Ephesians... When he, in Revelation where he said, have the seal of God in their foreheads. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse, let's go to verse 10. That in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven, which are on earth, even in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ in whom ye also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. We as Gentile believers have been sealed. Amen. When God, and we are not appointed to wrath. When God's wrath is poured down on this earth, because we are sealed by that Holy Spirit of promise, we will not be destroyed by God's wrath. For God has not appointed us to wrath. Amen? So then he says, um, verse 14, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession under the praise of his glory. So with the seal of the Holy Ghost on us, then the seal of God in the foreheads of the 144,000. That means that we are divinely protected. Now, think about Cain. What was the mark intended for on Cain? His protection. God himself set a mark on Cain. Okay, now... That marked him so that everybody then knew Cain. Okay, so that was the bad part of it. But at least they knew better than to kill him because I'm sure it was spread around. You know how things get told, right? See Cain? He killed his brother. Well, why don't we kill him? Well, see that mark? If you kill him, God will avenge you seven times. Oh, that's why y'all ain't killed him yet. That's exactly why we ain't killed him yet. We ain't going to either. We'll let God have it. So, and I know it sounds weird and I don't quite understand it. But God put a mark on Cain and that mark partly, I would say, was intended to protect him. But then Cain's the evil one and he's got a mark on him. So I want to draw your attention to a couple verses. First, Leviticus 19, 28. You should not make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead, nor print any marks upon you. I am the Lord. Don't get a tattoo. And you know how we are. If we go into an amusement park and they want to stamp our hand, we never give them our right hand, do we? Uh-uh, left hand, Jack. Now you ain't putting that on me. You know, we might get made fun of. I don't care. I take my Bible seriously. God said, I, that's a mark on the right hand. Well, you're not going to mark me on the right hand, I'll tell you that. Okay. Now, um, let me look at it. I should have done this earlier, but it didn't, it didn't really set in with me. 
Psalm, 1, Psalm 130, verse 3, If thou, Lord, shortest mark iniquities, O Lord, who shall stand? So we're, you look at the word mark in the Bible, and it gives you some ideas as to what this mark of the beast is about. Psalm 130 will tell you this is God marking iniquities. So everybody then who is not sealed by God is going to get the opposite of that seal. They're going to get the mark of the beast. And let me help you out right now with one thing. If you get it, you're not going to go to heaven. Period. I don't care what Tim LaHaye said in the book, The Mark. Because in that book, they wrote in the storyline that a guy gets the mark of the beast, but then he repents. And everybody says, well, it's okay because God looks on the inside. Excuse me. You people didn't read your Bible right because God said the mark was in their forehead and in their right hand. So that whole argument is nullified to begin with. But it basically gave the idea that some people get marked by the beast during this tribulation time, but they repent of it and God says, it's okay, I clear you. It's, yeah, it's... Yeah, and I, there's a story, came out this weekend, another company, uh, Am Amazon, is going to start experimenting with your ability to pay Amazon with the palm of your hand. Scan your hand, and the prints on your hand will identify you, and that's your payment system. Dun, dun, dun. Okay? But if thou, Lord, shouldest mark iniquities, who shall stand? And that's the point of it. When they are marked, they will fall. Uh, Jeremiah 2.22 For though thou wash thee with nitre and take thee much soap, yet thine iniquity is marked before me, saith the Lord. It has to do with iniquities. Um... Let's see here. If your surname is Mark, it's, you're, not gonna, you're not part of the Mark of the Beast. Oh, Romans 16, 17. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the dark doctrine which ye have learned and avoid them. I, talked about, I spoke on that issue yesterday. And I got some amens out of some good men. Because even in, the, in their own denomination, they had, Sterling to had a quarterly meeting because somebody wanted their church kids to memorize verses out of the English Standard Version. And before, it was all King James. So they were going to have this big, this big fight in this, in this district over the King James Bible issue. And could they use another translation for their Bible memorization programs and so on? And some pastors told me that they had friends in the ministry that they could have swore would never change their mind on this issue who sided with the other translation. And they said what happened was it separated men. And he said... In essence, it marked those men. Because before this issue came up, everybody thought everybody was on the same side. But when it rose to the surface, and men finally had to choose a side, then it was known who was and who wasn't. And that's a mark. Okay? That's a mark. Uh, so, I beseech you, brethren, mark them, which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the dark doctrine which you've learned, and avoid them. Uh, let's see here. Brethren, Philippians 3.17, brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them, which walk so, as you have us for, and in sample. Um, then the rest of it deals with the mark in the right hand or the, or the forehead. There's several other things in here I don't have time to... To pick them out tonight or to search through them, but search your Bible for the word mark or marks or marked. 
and um, and look and see what else the Bible says about it, all right? But it's basically God sealing and separating those who are idolatrous and those who are righteous. It's God's way of separating them out. And once you are sealed that way, you are sealed that way, you've made your choice. You stuck with it. But likewise, we've made our choice to follow the Lord. Amen? And I believe God has already sealed those of us. We've made our mind up. This is how it's going to be, and we're not changing. Let's stand to our feet.